with this. What is uh, StreamYard all about? Uh, uh, StreamYard is a it's a it's an interesting recording setup. Oh, okay. One moment. Let's see. Okay, and we are live. Hello and welcome to All of the Above. I'm James Brown. Thanks for joining me. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. But you can support my work at jamesbrowntv.substack.com. This is a show where we discuss big ideas. I, this is a show where we discuss ideas big and small with fascinating people. With today's guest, Douglas Hill. Hi, Douglas. Hello, James. Thanks for having me. Or do you prefer Doug? Doug's fine. Yeah, I go by either. Doug and I just did an episode of his show. Doug, tell us about it. Well, I about I don't know how, nearly a year ago now, I started doing a, a little podcast called Conversations with Sports Fans. Um, much as the title would suggest, it is uh, a discussion about being a sports fan. Uh, I try to focus initially on the origin story. You know, where did that come from? I think we all have an origin story. So I try to figure out or, or find out from the guest what that was. And, uh, and then we just see where the conversation leads. I, I try to be as unscripted as possible. Um, and in the case with our discussion recently, James, it was, um, you know, we had never met before, uh, interacted on Twitter a little bit, but didn't really know each other. So for me, it was a lot of fun to just kind of get to know you and, and learn a little bit about, um, you know, how you uh, evolved as a sports fan. I certainly enjoyed it too. And I, I encourage everybody who's watching or listening to check it out. Where can we find it? Um, you can find it on most of your um, podcasting applications at Conversations with Sports Fans. Or um, it's also housed on a, a little website that I curate called the thesportsfanproject.com the sportsfanproject.com. Now, Doug, we're going to talk a bit about your origins, but not necessarily your sports or origins. I, you told me that your career, for the most part, is in three chunks. So I'd like to examine all three chunks, if you don't mind. I am here uh, to do whatever you would like to do, James. So yes, take a deep dive into the life and times of Douglas Hill. That's fine. Okay. Where were you born? I was born in Decatur, Indiana, which is a, a pretty small town. Yeah. Eight to 9,000 people at the time in Northeastern Indiana in Adams County. And if you know anything about Indiana, it would be pretty much due South of Fort Wayne. That's the largest city near where I would came from. So due south of Fort Wayne, is that central or or east or west? Northeastern. Um, Decatur's probably about 12 or 13 miles from the Ohio border. So as a kid, were you fascinated by sports? Oh, did you yeah, yeah. did you want to be a sports writer? Because that's that was your first direction you went in. Yeah. Um, you know, some of my earliest recollections of, you know, sports was, you know, my dad was a huge Chicago Cubs fan and, um, he was actually the first guest on my podcast because I felt like I needed to go to patient zero for my sports fandom and, and he was it. Um, but he was a huge Chicago Cubs fan. And when I was young, um, you know, we lived in a, in a, in a mobile home and I would, be back in in my mom and dad's bed on occasion in the in the evenings and my dad had a one of those old tape recorders the old cassette tape recorder with the microphone and the cord and and he would say ernie and i would say banks he would say billy and i would say williams he would say ron i would say santo and so on and so forth we'd kind of go through the cubs roster or rosters at the time some of the history of the team so some of my earliest recollections of being a sports fan were that and then, yeah, I, I was a, a, you know, a bit of an athlete growing up. Uh, I was a, you know, I guess maybe a bigger fish in a small pond. 
my family eventually relocated to the metro detroit area uh, when i was 12 and i suddenly became a very small fish in a much larger pond and uh, when they started throwing curveballs at me in uh would have been i guess pony league uh suddenly the aspirations of being you know the high school baseball player and all the other things went out the window and for me i needed to figure out a way to stay involved because i really did enjoy sports a lot and you know, I, I've always had a bit of a proclivity for, or at least I felt like I did, and others have told me that I did, for writing. So it seemed to be a natural that if I couldn't play the sport anymore, I would move down the path of trying to be involved, perhaps from a journalistic standpoint, in, in reporting on the games. So I made a decision pretty early on when I was probably 14 or 15 years old that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a sports writer. So what were the baby steps there? Did you start writing in high school? Was it college or, or right thereafter? I began writing. Uh, I wrote for my high school newspaper, both my 11th and 12th grade year. Um, and then I ended up going to Eastern Michigan University and um, in, in Ypsilanti and got to EMU. And I think the third day on campus, I walked in to the newspaper office and applied. There was an, a vacancy. You know, you're always looking for student writers. And uh, so I sent them, I put my application in. The sports editor, you know, called me the next day and said, Doug, congratulations, you're hired. Um, make sure you're on the bus to go to Athens, Ohio with the volleyball team. You'll be covering the volleyball team in the fall. They have a tournament down in Athens uh, next weekend. Uh, contact the head coach, Frank Fristensky. And um, he'll get you all lined up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't even have a suitcase. Didn't have a duffel bag. My parents are coming back like two days after dropping me off at college to bring me something to to, to take my clothes with me on this trip with, um, you know, Frank and I think probably 15 women. Um, I knew nothing about volleyball. And uh, I'm the Eastern Michigan Hurons volleyball writer for the Eastern Echo student newspaper. Um, you know, my the end of my first week on campus and and away i went it was fun it was exhilarating uh, the deadlines were enjoyable we published three days a week monday wednesday friday obviously a lot of events in the weekends so the weekends were spent in the newspaper office you know writing your stories and getting the stuff done and i just i, I had a great time with it uh, later on i that year i covered the women's basketball team in the in the winter and then i had the baseball beat in the spring and uh, applied for and was hired as the sports editor my second year there. And the third year I was uh, the managing editor, uh, which would be a, you know, just a higher level title, I guess. When I think of my early days in journalism, one of the phrases that was a really great description is imposter syndrome. Did you go through that? Uh, I'm not sure I know what imposter syndrome means. So if you can give me a little perspective, I'll let you know if I did or didn't. That essentially that you did not think you were worthy of the role that you were given. Yeah, I, um, you know, I knew I was a capable enough writer. My issue was the fact that I didn't know, you know, really anything about volleyball. You know, we, we played volleyball in gym class in high school and I knew you had to rotate and you, you know, you couldn't catch the ball and throw it over the net and that type of stuff. So to watch, you know, it was not high division one volleyball by any stretch. It was the mid-American conference. It was, you know, back in the 1980s. So, you know, you know, it was not nearly the sport that it is today with some of the, the talent that's there today. So I did, didn't really know a lot about it. That was the difficult part. The good news with that is that um, the head coach, uh, again, Frank, was um, had defected from Czechoslovakia many years ago and you know was a high-level, high-caliber player back in his native country uh, on a men's team. I think he was a setter. And he, he, while he had a bit of an accent, he still was very good at helping me kind of understand what the sport was all about and, and how it worked. And I, you know, I, became to, I came to enjoy it. I'm not sure that I, you know, would go back willingly right now and, and watch you know, 34 matches or whatever it ended up being that year. Um, but 
yeah, I, I mean, to some extent, I probably was a, a bit of an imposter. But, you know, the, the conveying what happened in the match was not terribly difficult. I felt like I could do that, and I think I did a decent enough job with it. But you kind of had to, you know, fake it to make it for a while until you really understood what the heck was going on. Hey, all you kids out there, that's generally how you start anything. You fake it till you <laughs> make it because you usually aren't an expert going in, right? Yeah, that amen to that. And, you know, as you and I chatted about, you know, uh, on our, my show from a little bit earlier when we recorded that, you know, it was kind of the same thing with when I later on, I covered the University of Michigan hockey team. And, you know, again, coming from a, a small town in Indiana, we had the Fort Wayne Comets. So there was a hockey team there. I uh, saw maybe three or four games in my life and then, you know, had seen some games after I'd moved to Michigan. But really, hockey was not high in the hit parade for a Hoosier kid. I mean, basketball was the end all be all for us for the most part. So covering the University of Michigan hockey team, there was a lot that I had to learn there. And I was fortunate enough, the head coach at the time was Red Berenson, um, you know, former Montreal Canadian, St. Louis Blue, Detroit Red Wing, uh, played in the um, the Summit Series in 1972. You know, he's part of that you know, U.S. Uh, or not U.S. but Canada USSR big you know nine game series, and you know he was a wealth of information. And and while he could be a little rough around the edges on, at times, and you know a little gruff, he also would you know kind of pull uh, this young cub reporter aside and, and help me understand a little bit about the game, as would you know some of the uh, assistant coaches who were there at the time too. What time frame was this? I would have been covering the Michigan hockey team near the end of the 1991 season. Uh, the 90-91 season, because the, the writer at the time left to take a job to in Tampa or the Tampa area to cover the Tampa Bay Lightning, who were beginning a franchise in the next year. And then I covered the team in 91-92, 90, in 92-93. So it would have been two and a half seasons in that era. Michigan was just starting to turn the corner. I think we made, or not we, but they made a Frozen Four um, the third year I was there, which was kind of you know cool to get to. What other sports did you co professionally cover? Well, I, um, you know, if, if we are excluding, you know, the Eastern Echo, uh, the college experience, although we were paid. So there was, you know, I think it okay. was 10, 10 cents a column inch or some crazy figure like that. It wasn't, wow. it wasn't that... uh, a King's ransom by any stretch. You were loaded. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I, I mean, I was fortunate to be there uh, during the 1987, 88 athletic season. And I covered the football team when it went to the California bowl and played San Jose state its first bowl game. And, I don't know, 17, 18 years, and, and it's first and only bowl win until last year when Eastern Michigan won in the Idaho Potato Bowl. Um, hmm. So I was able to cover that, uh, which was a pretty, a pretty neat experience to go out to a bowl game for a week and kind of in bed with the team. And then I also covered the basketball team that season, the men's team, and that was its first trip to the NCAA tournament. Um, and that was the team led by Grant Long and Lorenzo Neely. They went out to Lincoln, Nebraska and, and got waxed by a very good University of Pittsburgh team that included um, Charles Smith, Jerome Lane, and a freshman point guard named Sean Miller, who went on to maybe greater success as a uh, Division I basketball coach. Um, and then, you know, covered hockey at, at the University of Michigan, uh, not at Michigan, but with the Ann Arbor News. Um, and then a lot of high school stuff along the way too, because you're not, you know, in a, in a community like Ann Arbor, there's a lot of uh, a lot of schools around, so you're doing a lot of Friday night lights types of things, Tuesday night, you know, hoops games. I eventually took a job up in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, and and covered the Fairbanks, Alaska hockey team. Uh, they had a Division One hockey program that. Uh, was on the way up at the time, and I took a flyer and went up there for 13 months. I was able to see the Midnight Sun baseball game, which was a pretty cool experience. Um, did some uh, dog mushing coverage on occasion. Uh, you know, a little bit of everything. You know, you, you do what, what you're assigned to do, and, and, you, and again, you fake it until you make it, because I didn't know a lot about dog mushing. That's for certain.
yeah, tell us about that experience in Alaska. Well, you know, in, in Ann Arbor, because at the time, the Ann Arbor newspaper was part of this chain of papers in Michigan uh, known as the Booth newspaper chain. It was owned by a company known as Booth. And they had papers in your, not your large metropolises like Detroit, or but they had like papers in Ann Arbor, Jackson, Grand Rapids, Saginaw, Flint. So the kind of middle size communities, but because they had all of these publications that they operated, they did not really need a full cadre of reporters anywhere. So in the Ann Arbor News, I had a job that was known as permanent part-time. So another tip for the kids, if you have a job called permanent part-time, you might want to be looking for something that's more permanent and less part-time. Um, so I needed to make a move as a journalist. I needed to find a job that was a full-time job because I was you know, advancing in my age at the point, and I needed to kind of make a decision on what I wanted to do with my career. And I had simultaneous uh, interviews, you know, like within a day of each other and job offers. One was in Hickory, North Carolina, um, which is kind of northeast or northwest, I think, of Charlotte. And the other uh, was in Fairbanks. And uh, I got offers from both. I did the math on Hickory and realized rather quickly that for what they were going to be paying me, I would need to either have a second job or I would need to live, um, you know, uh, a poverty lifestyle because it was not going to pay very well, even though the cost of living was certainly less than what I was experiencing where I was at in Michigan, and it was going to be significantly less than what I was going to find in Fairbanks. But Fairbanks, um, the compensation was much better than, than uh, Hickory. And the other thing with regards to Fairbanks is that I had always wanted to go to Alaska. I wanted to visit. I was fascinated by the state, the wilderness, the expanses, the mountains, you know, everything that you think of when you think of Alaska. It is all very real. And I wanted to I wanted to visit. And my girlfriend at the time, who, you know, in another two weeks will be have been my wife for 28 years, told me at that time, you need to go because we had just met like within six months of this all coming down. She said, you need to go because I don't want to hear what if in 25 years <laughs> and you know, bless her heart. You know, here we are almost 28 years later and there's never been a what if. Um, so it was, it was, you know, fantastic. And, and at the time this was 1993, uh, you know, the Fairbanks kind of reminded me if, if you recall the old Christmas special from days gone by that included the land of misfit toys. Um, you know, a lot yeah. of folks, I think, wound up in Fairbanks because they didn't quite fit in in other places, but <clears throat> they fit in just fine in Fairbanks because they were with their people. They found each other. And, you know, it's a bit of a, you know, I guess a tribe almost. And it was, you know, a wonderful experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, you know, I was able to be there for a full year. So I got to experience all four seasons such as they are, um, you know, spring and, and fall are pretty brief. Summer burns very bright, 24 hours a day. Um, it's you know pretty cool to, to leave your, you know, putting the newspaper to bed at 12.30 in the morning and go to the park and play pickup basketball until 1.30 or 2 in the morning without the need of any light. Um, the winters were rough. Uh, it was a rough winter. Uh, Thanksgiving weekend, the, the low temperature got down to 47 below, and that's with no wind chill, just 47 below. Um, and the interesting thing about Thanksgiving weekend up there at the time is the, the, the UAF men's basketball team, which is a division two team every year hosted a tournament of champions. And the concept was that they invited the champions from the previous year, the national champions from division two, division three and NAIA up. And then Fairbanks was the fourth team and they played a little tournament. Um, and one of the teams that was up that year was Hawaii Pacific. And I talked to um, the sports information director at Hawaii Pacific, uh, you know, as part of, you know, getting stuff together for the story, you know, for that weekend's action. And he said they'd left Honolulu's airport and the temperature was 86 degrees. They landed in Fairbanks airport and the temperature was minus 36 degrees. <laughs> they, they, they basically, every article of clothing they brought with them on that trip they wore all the time because they were, you know, as cold as you could imagine. Um, and we actually, I went out to start my car and my colleague's car 
at halftime of the first game of the semifinals and the Hawaii Pacific bus had pulled up uh, because you had to start the cars. Otherwise, the engine blocks would freeze. It was it's a whole thing. You're from upstate New York. You might be familiar with that. Um, so we, we um, I go out and the bus had just pulled up and I swear I did not see the Hawaii Pacific team run that fast or that hard the rest of the weekend playing basketball on the court that they did from the bus inside to the arena because they wow. were in a dead sprint because it was every bit of 42 below that at that time. Wow. Um, but, you know, to your, I guess your question, you're able to see things that you wouldn't necessarily see in terms of sports. You know, the, the University of Alaska Fairbanks had um, one of the national the the highest ranked um rifle teams in the country you know ncaa does have a rifle program or you know national championships for rifle they were great uh cross-country skiing team was um very well you know re recognized and renowned as well um then you would have your you know your sports that you would have that are a little bit off the beaten path you know ski drawing which is you know essentially a, a single sled dog you're on skis and then this the sled dog is attached to you and and the dog pulls you through with your poles and your skiing cross-country skiing but with a dog pulling you that was a sport that we could cover uh the dog mushing there would be sprint races at the uh, local um, kind of park place that was there uh the year i was there the um yukon quest which is actually at the time i think was a hundred or 150 miles longer than the Iditarod sled dog race, one of the you know ultra marathon types of things. Uh, they would rotate the start finish between Fairbanks and uh, Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory, and it would kind of follow the path of the Yukon River all the way uh, to its destination. The year I was there, that was the start. Fairbanks was the start site, so I was able to see the start of that race, which was fascinating to see because you've got you know, 30 or 40 teams of dogs in all throughout downtown Fairbanks. And the dogs are just eager to get started. They're all barking and, you know, howling and, you know, defecating and throwing up. And, you know, every, like any good athlete would be nervous before a game. They're the exact same way, but they're four legged critters and they're eager to get started. And to see them roll out and how eager they were to get going was really a, a pretty cool experience. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. There are a couple pieces of your description that I, I want to go into a bit further. Okay. I'll, I'll start with one in Alaska, and then we'll go back to the other one. Can you walk us through what it was like dressing for that kind of wind chill? Do you, what do you recall of it? Like, were you wearing, how many layers did you wear? Did you have long johns on? What, what was going on? How, how, how did you prepare to go out in that kind of weather? Because even in even where I am here and we are in Blizzardville, we don't get that low. Yeah. You know, it's um, it really is an interesting dynamic because what I discovered you know, shortly after the winter started, I, I learned two things. One was from and the name escapes me now, but he at the time was the uh, business writer for the paper. And he gave me a piece of advice that I have carried with me to this day, even though I'm now no longer in, you know, close to the Arctic Circle. And I've passed down to my children and anyone else who will listen. And that piece of advice was make sure you have in your vehicle at all times during the winter months, whatever you will need to not freeze to death. So that means, you know, candles, um, you know, blankets, other types of, you know, whatever provisions you may need, some extra food, you know, those types of things, because you never know what may or may not happen. So that was the one thing that I took to heart. The other piece was that folks function up there very, very um, matter of factly to about 25 or so below zero. You know, they didn't, I mean, the, the downhill ski place that was near us would still be open at 20 below, which to me is just mind boggling that you would want to go and have wind blow across your face at a higher level in that kind of a temperature. But folks didn't care. And part of the reason I think in Fairbanks is because there's not a lot of humidity. It's not, you know, like, where you're at or where I'm at in the winter, it, it can, it maybe it's only 10 degrees out, but if it's pretty humid or moist out, that just gets in your bones and it just sinks in and it's, it's an awful feeling, but you also are, are dressing for the, for the weather, you know, yes. Um, long johns or base layers were very common. 
Um, you would have the, the highest level Sorel boots that you could find, or a lot of folks wore the old military bunny boots, which are these big white boots that, you know, make you look like you had, you know, bunny feet or cartoon character feet on, but they're heavily insulated and, and do a good job to keep the toes safe. Uh, you're, you know, almost always wearing some sort of a wool sock or something along those lines to kind of wick it away and, and keep things dry because, you know, uh, moisture is not your friend. If you get anything wet in that kind of weather, you're, you're sunk. But yeah, you would just, you know, heavy parkas, um, hats, gloves, you name it, you were going to put that on. <clears throat> now, that's not to say that I was outside every day, um, you know, hanging out, you know, on the picnic table or whatever, tipping them back or something, because you wouldn't do that in the winter. I mean, you would, you would just, you know, go about your business and do what you had to do, but you always made sure you had some precautions. How many hours a day would you say you, you'd go outside in those peak times? Was it, obviously you were limiting exposure, but did you go out like every once did, did you, you didn't go out for pleasure or did you? I did not. I mean, I, I mean, I had coworkers and friends who were, you know, I guess more seasoned, maybe they'd been there a little bit longer than I had, or perhaps some of them, a couple of them were actually natives, you know, of, of the state and, and they didn't really have an issue with it. They would do some things out there. One of my coworkers, Tim was a, was a musher and he, you know, he had a sled dog team and he would be out every day training the dogs. Um, that's what he did. That was kind of his hobby and his, like, I don't want to call it a side hustle, but um, that was his thing. I was more or less that I would go to the, you know, go out to the grocery store, you know, do my banking. Uh, if I had a story to cover, I'd go and, and do that. Uh, most of my stuff in the, in, as a sports writer in the wintertime, of course, is, is inside. But I would have the occasional outdoor event. And it's difficult because at the time, um, you know, you know, just using a cell phone or whatever to record something was not an option. So you're having to write. And that was the hardest part I had was trying to, you know, take either take my glove off and try to write on paper. And my hand is shaking so bad that I couldn't read it hardly after I was done. Or the other thing is sometimes the pen wouldn't work because it was so cold. So wow. pencils were always a, a, a necessary to have with you as well, just to make sure you could have something you could actually write something down with. Um, but I, I didn't spend a lot of time outside. Um, and but I, I would definitely I, I love the nighttime, uh, especially getting out at 11, 12 o'clock at night. And, and where I lived, um, my home was enough off the beaten path. And I would invariably pull up in my in my park spot and I would get out of the car. I look up and I would oftentimes see the northern lights kind of dancing above me, typically the greens. But every now and again, you'd see a red or a yellow. And that was, you know, I would just stand out there and just gaze to the sky. It didn't mind what the temperature was at all because it was just so mesmerizing. You also mentioned your wife, your, your then girlfriend. Yeah. She, she told you that she didn't want to hear any what ifs in 25 years. Yeah. So she knew. Well, I mean, um, I think if, if she was sitting here next to me right now, um, she would probably say that she knew. Yeah. Um, I, I think I knew as well. You know, we had met that previous December. And um, by the time I'm making these decisions, I guess it is what, June, I suppose, of the next, you know, June of, of 93. And yeah, she was very supportive. Um, you know, she was not going to move and live with me because she had her own job. She had her own little career that was beginning up and we were going to kind of wait and see how it went and figure out, okay, who has the best job and we'll figure out what we're going to do then. I did in, um, in 93 and her birthday, she's a Christmas Eve baby. So December 24th, I did, um, propose to her, um, from Alaska via vhs tape and for you kids out there those are the <laughs> things that existed before netflix okay um so i had my my friend josh um recorded me and i i read twas the night before christmas uh sitting on one of the stanchions of the trans alaska pipeline on about a 26 or 27 degree below zero day so josh is having a hard time holding the camera steady because he's you know it's cold and at one of those old camcorders and I read twas the night before Christmas and I had some gifts to pass out to 
to um, you know all the family that was going to be watching the video down in Michigan because I sent one to you know my wife's family or my girlfriend's family at the time and one to my family that was going to be viewed the next day and at the end of the of the piece I go oh, I've got one more gift um, and I think uh, Joe I think you have it and Joe is my now my brother-in-law you know, my my uh, wife's brother and and Joe brought out this ring box and inside the ring box was a cigar band because I didn't have the kind of money to buy the ring and I didn't want to get that wrong either I wanted to make sure I got the right ring um, so, you know, I said, will you marry me? And that's kind of the tape cuts out at that point, And that's the end of the story. The same type of thing played out with my family, um, at their Christmas celebration the next day, except I just said at the end, I, I, I rolled the dice that she was going to say yes and said, oh, by the way, um, Carol and I are engaged now or something like that. So, wow. So a couple follow-ups there. Do you still have the tape? <laughs> You know, we were just talking about this the other day with a with a, a friend of ours, and we do, we do have the tape. Um, my wife um, is pretty fastidious and, and knows just exactly where it's at. Uh, we have not watched it in a long time, so presumably it is still good. But the person we were talking to suggested that we maybe maybe it's time to get that transferred over to something more stable and durable. Um, we, to my knowledge, have not shared it with our two children yet, who are now adults, wow. but we probably wow. should do that at some point. Uh, we do still, the other question that you're probably going to ask is, do you have an operational VCR? And the answer is yes. We still have one of those in our house that is functional. So, No, that wasn't my other question, but <laughs> I have I have one of those too, actually. I, I saw one at like a Goodwill and I, and I figured, oh, I'm a, I'm a, as you know, I'm a media geek, and just the idea of having another piece of dead technology around me, you know, that sounded cool. Why not? Yeah. So my other follow-up is, do you still have the cigar band? I do not believe the cigar band is still with us. I think oh. that has been lost to the ages. I would have to ask uh, Carol about that, but I don't think that she still does. Man. Although I could, I could be wrong. Um, but I needed something to present her. I couldn't just, you know, have nothing. I, so that was the best I could do at that moment in time. Why'd you leave Alaska? Well, um, you know, I was at that point, I was now engaged. Um, and we had throughout the course of the you know sp winter and spring of 94, began to plan the wedding and what that was going to look like. And by we, I mean, she. Uh, was planning the wedding and I would just say yes a lot and, and agree with just about everything. But I, I had um, an opportunity to come back to the Metro Detroit area to work at a, a newspaper in Pontiac, Michigan called the Oakland Press. Oakland County is um, where Pontiac is situated. It was called the Oakland Press. I had a, a friend of mine from college who was a sports writer there. He said that there was an opportunity that was not yet full time, but he felt like it would be full time. And I just decided that it was probably time to get back there because I knew how important my wife's extended family was to her. I didn't know how that was going to play out if, you know, I stayed in Fairbanks and she came up. So I made the decision to come back because there was an opportunity for me to come back. And how long did you stay in sports writing and why did you leave? Um, well, I, if we count my college time, which would have been uh, the fall of 85, I was a sports writer through really about um, 1999 or 2000. But I, I made a clean break from the Oakland press. I, I, I quit there in uh, late July or early August of 1997. And the reason for that was our daughter. Uh, my wife at the time, speaking of VHS tapes, uh, was a district manager for Blockbuster Video. Um, so she was working more of a traditional nine to five job. And, you know, as a sports writer, you know, when are those events? Those events are typically in the evenings and on the weekends. And, you know, we would maybe see each other on Mondays on occasion in the evening, uh, or we would be, you know, tagging each other in and out to, you know, 
take care of our, our daughter. And what I decided at that point is that this was not the kind of uh, quality of life or family environment that I wanted for my now growing family. We, I wanted to make sure that there was something a little more traditional, maybe. Is that maybe the wrong word? I don't know, but more conventional. Maybe that's the better term. Um, so I decided to, to quit and go back to school. And, and I, I made a clean break. I quit completely, went back to school full time to earn my teaching certificate, my teaching degree. Why teaching? Uh, you know, um, it's, it's interesting because as I look back at it, even then, but even more so now, I realized that I probably knew too early on what I wanted to do when, when I suddenly couldn't hit the curveball and I couldn't, you know, compete in the basketball court anymore. And I knew I wanted to be a sports writer. I just poured all of my energy into that. But all along, I mean, there were signs everywhere. If I was, you know, just paying attention and, and, you know, with age and wisdom comes the ability to maybe look back and reflect and see those. But I had very impactful teachers in my life. I had a, a fifth grade teacher named Craig Anderson in, in Decatur, Indiana, who was my first ever male teacher. And he was the first one who really took an interest in my writing and really gave me some constructive feedback and encouraged me to be more creative and do more things with it. Uh, we moved between fifth grade and sixth grade up to Michigan, and I had a difficult time adjusting. And uh, my sixth grade teacher was Nancy Schulte, who was, um, you know, as later on as I became an educator, I was able to see all of the wonderful stuff that she did for me. I didn't know it at the time. I don't even know if my parents knew it at the time, but she really saw somebody who was having a difficult time um, blending in with the rest of the class and figuring out my place in there because it was a, a difficult move. Um, you know, we, we moved up to the community that we were going to live in and started school right after Labor Day, but we weren't able to have occupancy of our house there for like 30 days. So we were driving in from like 20 or 25 minutes away every day. So I didn't have the chance to you know, walk home from school with other kids or hang out or do any of that. And it was very difficult for me to kind of, you know, make friends. And she really was very good in getting me involved in different types of class activities. Um, so I, I looked at those two teachers in particular in my own life. Um, certainly I had some in high school and again in college that were impactful, but those were the two that just really seemed to hit. And then the other piece that led me down the path is my grandmother uh, was a, a third grade teacher for the better part of 30 years uh, in the community that I lived in in Indiana. And uh, my wife's mother-in-law was an educator in Detroit public schools for 40 plus years. And I had always been surrounded by educators, it seems. And then finally, the, the piece that I reflected on was all of the lovely conversations, not about the game or the event that I was covering with all of the high school coaches that I experienced along the way, but just how I saw them impacting these, you know, athletes who were also students. And, you know, nine times out of 10, those coaches are also teachers. And I began to start asking questions of, to some of the coaches that I had a pretty good rapport with to kind of learn about what that was like and, and how did they enjoy it? What, what did they get out of it? And I realized as I was moving toward the end of my time in journalism, um, that, that that was where I wanted to go. I wanted to go into education. I wanted to make a difference, much like Mr. Anderson did for me and Mrs. Schulte did for me. I wanted to be that person for other young people who were going to be, you know, going through school. Have you? Wow. Um, I would love to say that I have. Um, I've received some very lovely um notes and thanks from some of the students that I've taught. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, th I think I have, but you know, it's interesting, much like me, um, maybe they don't realize the impact that I or some of their other teachers had on them, you know, for, you know, a decade or more or many decades more after they have left. Um, you know, I, I had the ability to write um, a pretty heartfelt note to Mr. Anderson um, shortly after I became a teacher and, you know, was kind of an unburdening, if you will, thanking him for all that he had done for me. 
And, you know, he just filled my bucket right back by remembering many particular details about who I was, the class I was in and everything else, which I would not have expected he, he would have done. Um, so I'm hoping that that there are, you know, some students out there walking around right now who have benefited from my experience as a writer and bringing that into a classroom and trying to help them see that, you know, no piece is ever really done. You're always going to be editing. You're always going to be revising. You can always improve it with something. Um, I would hope that they think that, you know, we've had some fun along the way. I didn't take myself very seriously in the classroom and, and am hopeful that, you know, they understood that they shouldn't take themselves that seriously as well. But, you know, you don't get a lot of, uh, a lot of the positive stuff back from either families or students. It tends to be more the negative uh, when you're in education, unfortunately. So um, it's a long way of saying, I, I think I have, but I can't tell you with any qualitative data that I have. You say you get the negative back from the families and the students. What are those interactions like? Are, are, are there the one, obviously we don't want to use their names, but are there ones that stick with you that are that were are hard to carry? Well, um, no, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that anything has really remained under my craw for all of these years. But, you know, as a parent, you know, I'm a parent. I have two grown children now. You want what's best for your, your child, and you're certainly going to be an advocate for your child. But I'm not sure that parents, you know, know what the child is like between the hours of eight and three every day or whatever the time frame is that sometimes the child you are experiencing at home, perhaps, um, you know, we look at them with uh, perhaps some rose colored glasses on occasion. And, you know, I, I certainly with 30 kids in a class or whatever it ends up being, I'm, I'm, I'm not there to uh, make any child's life miserable. That's not what my job is. I just want to get, see what, the best that can possibly happen and come from them. So a lot of times it was just differences of opinion, um, you know, concerns about this, you know, a couple of, you know, claims were made about, you know, my teaching practices that I did not appreciate. Um, but I don't think I, I mean, I, I heard a friend of mine say once upon a time that, you know, the softest or the most comfortable pillow is a clean conscious. And, and I am very comfortable laying my head down every night knowing that, Everything that I have done has been um, with the best interest of the students that I've taught in mind. So their personality shift shapes? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Is it the, I'm, I'm just trying to think of my, my own experience as a student and, you know, you're away from your parents, you're away from your family. There's peer pressure. Um, there's who you think you are versus who other people may think you are. Do any any thoughts or opinions on why the behavior would be different in a school environment versus home? Well, I think sometimes it can be, you know, the impact of, you know, the friendship group that you are perhaps part of. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to be as nice as I can with that, but sometimes you fall in with the wrong crowd and there's some bad influences out there and, and, you know, and we're dealing with, with children too. I mean, primarily I taught fourth and fifth grade, so we're not talking about fully formed, um, brains at that point. Uh, we're not making the best decisions all the time. And, and sometimes they do some things that, you know, they shouldn't do, or they are, you know, following the path of someone else who perhaps they shouldn't be following the path of. Um, not to say that, you know, it's right, wrong, or indifferent, but, you know, sometimes we make mistakes. And, and I think with the difference between probably my parents, and I would even say perhaps your parents, although I've never met your parents, um, and the parents of the students that I was, you know, working with at the time is, you know, they, um, it, it was more of a helicopter bulldozer type of a parent that they were going to do whatever they could to ensure that their kid um, was always going to come out on the right side of whatever happened, as opposed to perhaps our parents who would, I don't want to call it tough love, but would, you know, allow those natural 
occurrences or natural repercussions to kind of fall where they may. And, you know, if you made a bad choice in school, then this is, you know, what is coming of that. I mean, the, the time I bopped the kid in the mouth during lunch recess when I was in third grade, you know, I was disciplined at school and I was also disciplined at home because that's not something you're supposed to do, Doug. You know, you, you can't do that. And I think as we've, you know, evolved and, and changed perhaps as a nation in terms of the parenting norms and, and, and the patterns that we follow, it's a little bit different now. It's yeah. Fourth, fourth and fifth. Go ahead. I was going to say quite a bit different actually, but yes, go ahead. Fourth and fifth grade. Yeah. Fourth and fifth grade. I, I think those are very impressionable times. You, I, I would totally agree. You're, you're far from fully formed. And I would wonder if, if they even have a sense of what you should behave like in public yet. I'm not sure I did. I don't think I was, you know, just thinking of my experience, I don't think I was, for the most part, a troubled kid. But I don't know that I had a clear vision of how I should uh, um, this play myself in a classroom i'm not sure i had a sense of it i just i knew what i was told yeah <laughs> and <laughs> you know like i remember uh like i had a mr ventura in fifth and sixth grade and uh because at my school they uh they we had the same teachers in, yeah they in they, they, yeah they, they looped with you it's called looping oh that's what it's yeah. called yeah oh i was looped um <laughs> uh for uh for uh, third and fourth and fifth and sixth. And I, I, I knew when he went, that guy would, would say my full name, James Adam Brown. And he would ask me to put my shoulders back and sit up in the chair and, um, and focus. And, um, so I knew what I was told, but I'm not sure I had an internal, like, idea of how I should be in a social situation at that point. So I could totally see your point about them sort of being kind of, you know, kind of malleable for, by, uh, of kids and, um, that, that have maybe have a more developed sense of good or bad about how they should behave in, in those moments. Yeah, certainly I think impressionable would be the probably the term that I would use, although I like malleable, that's even better. Um, but yeah, they, they definitely, some, as you noted, are a little bit further on that continuum of, of understanding perhaps the, you know, proper and improper ways to interact or behave. Um, but I think, you know, in a much larger context, one of the things that we, we have done a pretty poor job of as a society in general is re-looking at how we educate and, and, and what a classroom looks like and, and how we instruct and all of that, you know, is, you know, we're essentially using a similar model that we used from what, 120 years ago or whatever it is now. Um, and I, I dare say that we have come a long way, baby. Um, maybe we shouldn't be trying to still do the things the same way. Not that that's going to change the way that children are behaving, but, you know, the fact that we're trying to get everybody to conform and, and do things one way so that we can manage better as a teacher, you know, that's, that's on me. I needed to do a better job of that. But at the same time, I think on a larger, you know, global perspective here in the, in the, in the United States that we really need to have an earnest conversation about what our, you know, pre-K through, you know, high school education looks like and is the way that we structure this, what's best for um, all of the students that we serve and the learning that we hope that they undertake. I've done a fair amount of education reporting and uh, I, I think of a piece I, I wrote uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. So uh, where the question was, are we teaching math the right way, essentially? And in, in, in terms of like, teaching personal finance in school in particular. Um, but I, just to broaden that idea and, and to address your, your statement there, 
you know, I, I, I tend to agree that we, you know, history points to us, you know, trying to create this education system for uh, uh, basically assembly worker, assembly line workers and people who were working on farms. It's a very agrarian system. Um, in fact, that's, uh, as I understand, that's why we have summers off. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if you had your druthers and you had control, how would you reshape it? Would you, do we need year round education? Do we need smaller classrooms? Do we need varying types of classrooms? What, uh, would you would you individualize schools for, for different approaches? Like, how would you go about it? I know that's a giant question. Take any element of it you like. <laughs> yeah, going back to our previous conversation about being a sports czar, you know, you're asking me to be the education czar. I'm not sure Hell that I yeah. want that. I'm not sure I want that job either. But, uh, um, I mean, it's it's a it's a great question, and it really is one that you know, off the top, I'm a proponent of trying to get ourselves or our students in a school environment around the around the clock during the calendar you know year round and it, i'm not saying that we need to necessarily greatly expand the days of instruction but there is definitely something to the fact that going away for eight ten weeks during the course of the summer is not a good idea it is not sound practice um, you know for these students to essentially um, leave learning behind for the better part of two months. And, you know, it, it doesn't hit everybody the same way, which is also part of the problem. You know, if, if everybody was impacted the same way, then we could probably adjust and do something differently. But the fact that we have, you know, some of our students are going, you know, a, a home for the summer to no structure, no supports, no nothing, because we have different types of family dynamics at home now that makes it very very difficult for them to retain or build upon anything that they've had so yeah i'm a proponent for trying to get us into more of a year-round schooling environment um, again you know maybe we have a few weeks off during the month of july just to kind of shut it down and um, get buildings refurbished or whatever we have to do but to just go away for eight, 10 weeks is not, I don't, I don't think sound educational practice. And a lot of the, of the research would, would support that. And there are pockets out there that, that do it, but it's not like it's a widespread entire district. I'm sure that they exist. I'm not familiar with every you know school district in the United States. And I'm sure that there are some that are doing it across all of their, all of their levels and everything. But in the region that I'm in here, I know of you know, maybe an elementary school here or a middle school there or something there that is doing, you know, um, more of a balanced calendar, more of a year round piece. Doug Hill, any famous last words? Oh, famous. No, I've got nothing famous for you, James. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to have you back. I have a, a zillion more questions, but I'd said I'd, I'd, I'd hold you to about an hour. Uh, I mean, we can go as long as you want. I don't care. Yeah, but I let's let's do a part two, if you don't well, mind. Part two? I'm down with part two. I, you know, I thought Iron Man 2 was better than Iron Man 1, so there you go. Okay. I'm ending the broadcast now.